Hello everyone, a very good morning and welcome to An Academy, a one-stop destination for the English medium civil services aspirants. Welcome to the daily Hindu news analysis. So let's begin today's discussion by first looking at the topics that we are going to discuss. From the daily edition of the Hindu, I have chosen seven important topics for a detailed discussion and analysis. Before we take up these topics, we have a few important announcements. Today at 8 p.m., we shall be conducting a special live workshop. Sarmad Mehrad sir will help you understand how to crack the UPSC civil services examination in your first attempt with seven easy, effective steps. So do attend the workshop without fail and you can register by using the link provided in the description of this video. And also, as part of the free special classes that we are running on the Unacademy app, today, these are the sessions that are lined up. Starting from 11.30 a.m., Sham sir will be conducting a session on the important topic of tax devolution, which has been dominating current affairs as a result of the rift that has erupted between the center and opposition-ruled state governments. Then later at 1 p.m., I shall be taking up a very important discussion on the implications of Gaza war on Indian national interests. We have a history session by Abhishek sir at 2.30 p.m. that deals with the partition of Bengal and the Swadeshi movement. And again in the evening at 5 p.m., Sham sir will discuss the white paper on Indian economy that has been presented by the finance minister a couple of days ago. So part one of this session will take place today and the second part of the session will be held on Monday. So these are the important sessions available on the Unacademy app and the links for all these sessions are also provided in the video description. So with this, let's begin with the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper by looking at a very, very important development which is reported on page number one. The government of India has announced three more Bharat Ratna awards to eminent personalities. All the three awards have been provided posthumously in fact, in the last few weeks, the government of India has announced five Bharat Ratna Awards, which is a record in itself. So over the past few sessions, we have understood what are the Bharat Ratna Awards. It is the highest civilian award in the country. Right? We spoke about why Bharat Ratna was provided to Karpuri Thakur, the social reformer and top politician from Bihar. Why it has been awarded to Lal Krishna Dwani. And now, three other eminent personalities have been chosen by the government of India. One is M.S. Swaminathan, the top agricultural scientist of India, largely credited with, with championing the Green Revolution in the country. And two former Prime Ministers, P.V. Narsimha Rao and Charan Singh, Chaudhary Charan Singh. So I'm not going to waste your time by talking about Bharat Ratna Awards again. But however, this development, it gives us an opportunity to talk about the enormous contribution of some of these individuals. With regard to Charan Singh, who was the Prime Minister of India for a brief period from 1979 to 1980. He was credited with championing the cause of the peasants, the farmers, etc. But other than that, Charan Singh's contributions are largely political and not too relevant for the exam. But however, the contribution of M.S. Swaminathan and P.V. Narsimha Rao, it is quite enormous when it comes to nation building. So there are some core topics, UPSC topics that we can pick up from here and discuss and understand given that these two eminent personalities have been awarded with India's highest civilian honor. So let's explore this topic in detail by first talking about the Green Revolution. We will not just focus on their individual efforts, we will focus on the national challenges during their period and how they contributed to help India overcome these challenges. The Green Revolution played a critical role in making India self-sufficient with regard to food security. In the 1950s, 1960s, India was facing an enormous food crisis. We were living a ship-to-mouth existence. So during this period, if our parents or even grandparents, if they had a plate of meal on their table, we all should be grateful and thankful to this man over here, M.S. Swaminathan, who played an incredible role in championing the Green Revolution of India. So back then, India was suffering from severe food shortages. 
and today if you compare that era with with today today india is not just self sufficient but we are also one of the world's largest producer of most of the food grains and we are also one of the largest exporters of food grains as well so to understand this transformation it's very important to talk about these historical developments ms swaminathan is credited with championing india's green revolution that guaranteed india's food security so this revolution which we saw in the late 60s and 1970s is what put india on the path of achieving food security so if you look at the biography of ms swaminathan you will notice that he has a incredible trajectory in his career and in his personal life he grew up during the horrors of the bengal famine during the second world war in 1940s when british policies and british mismanagement under winston churchill had triggered a massive famine in bengal during the war efforts britain had diverted most of the food grains to meet the needs of the soldiers while allowing a crisis to perpetuate in bengal a food crisis to perpetuate in bengal millions of people died in this famine and it was in this era that ms swaminathan grew up so right from the beginning he had a inclination towards agriculture towards food related issues and he wanted to contribute to nation building efforts post indian independence and what is interesting is that ms swaminathan was also a civil service aspirant just like all of you and he successfully cleared the exam as well he was supposed to join the ips but fortunately he pursued his interest i think there lies a very important lesson for all of us when you pursue something what you love what you are really passionate about that is when you make the best possible contribution to the nation and the society so other than civil services there are many other avenues many other opportunities where we can contribute towards nation building and ms swaminathan is a example for that so he got a scholarship to study agriculture genetics in europe and he immediately jumped on the opportunity and gave up his career in ips and thus began his journey in the field of agricultural research now let's move away slightly from ms swaminathan and his personal life and let's look at the challenges that india was dealing with during this period that is post independence in 1950s and 1960s during the 1965 war there was a message that then prime minister lal bahadur shastri had promoted on radio uh, he had urged the indian public to sacrifice one meal per day sacrifice one meal uh, at least a week so that india could manage the food supplies and thus overcome the food security crisis that we were facing during war time because during war time and during emergencies it's always difficult to arrange for logistics and distribution and india was facing a enormous food crisis throughout 1960s so this one incident during the 65 war and the statement of the prime minister illustrates the kind of challenge india was facing imagine the prime minister coming on radio urging people to give up one meal at least why because the country didn't have enough food supplies this is where india stood because the british they had destroyed india's native agriculture india's agricultural system had been destroyed most of the agricultural land was largely controlled by the zamindars the so called landlords india had not introduced scientific agriculture india was struggling with multiple challenges at that point from external security challenges to internal security problems to grave economic challenges the government was overburdened and in india agriculture was still subsistence agriculture traditional agriculture with no scientific inputs so at this point india had to make some very difficult choices people were starving malnutrition levels were very high hunger was very prominent and this also had to do with the colonial policies of the pre independence era when burma was carved out of british india the supply of pulses was hit because burma was a major cultivator of pulses then partition of india and pakistan took away west pakistan and east bengal which were major food grain producing regions east bengal was a rice bowl west pakistan 
was a wheat bowl, a wheat granary. So the impact of partition, the impact of colonial policies was spilling over post-independence as well. And the initial Indian governments under Prime Minister Nehru, Lal Bahadur Shastri and Indira Gandhi, they were dealing with incredible challenges in the area of food from 1950s all the way till 1970s. The first two decades was dominated by the challenge in food security. India was essentially living a ship to mouth existence. What do you mean by this? It basically means we were dependent on food imports and food aid provided by other countries in order to feed our people. India wasn't producing enough to match the food requirement of the country. We relied upon the United States in particular. The US had already predicted a potential agricultural food security crisis in India. Number of American agricultural experts had met with Prime Minister Nehru as well, highlighting the upcoming crisis. Then India went on and signed a key agreement with the US, the PL 480 agreement, Public Law 480 agreement, under which the US promised food aid to India. The US started supplying wheat, a staple food grain, and some quantities of rice as well to help India overcome the devastating food crisis. But however, the food supplies provided by the US was of very inferior and poor quality. This was seen as humiliation for India and Indians. There were statements in the media that the food grains that US was providing was not even consumed by pigs. That is how comparisons were being made with regard to the quality of grains that US was supplying. And also US was not doing charity here. It was pressurizing then Prime Ministers, Lal Bahadur Shastri and then Indira Gandhi to allow American companies to enter the Indian market, to privatize several sectors of the Indian economy so that American companies could enter and dominate the market in return for food aid from the US. But the Prime Ministers resisted. Both Lal Bahadur Shastri and Indira Gandhi, they resisted the American pressure to allow American industries into India. And as a result, the food aid from the US would take a hit. So India switched to imports as well from Canada, Australia. We imported a lot of wheat and we were paying quite heavily as well for these food imports. And just a tangential story here. Another interesting story related to this is that, have you seen the Parthenium plant? I'm sure of everywhere in India, in every street, in every corner, you come across this particular plant. Colloquially, it's called the Congress plant. This is an invasive weed species that entered India from the American tropics through the PL480 program. This was another gift of the US to India. As weed supplies were coming in through the food aid program under PL480, the spores of the Parthenium plant right, entered India and today it has become a widespread invasive weed species. Since it came under the Congress regime, it's popularly called the Congress plant as well, right. So just a tangential story rel related to it. So this is how India was leading a food to, a ship to mouth existence. We were relying on food aid and imports and hence it's referred to as ship to mouth existence. Ships were bringing the food supplies and we were bringing food on the plates of the common man. So this is no situation that a country should aspire for, right? So this is where India focused on agricultural revolution, which would be later termed as the Green Revolution of India. And MS Swaminathan would play a critical role to his strategic vision to guide and enable the Green Revolution of India. The Green Revolution was not just a scientific achievement in the field of agriculture and agricultural research but it was a survival strategy for India. So MS Swaminathan, after gaining a lot of experience in agriculture genetics and after working in US, in Europe, right, he would come back and under the then Indira Gandhi government, under a very popular agriculture minister, C. Subramanian, MS Swaminathan would lead and champion India's efforts to in initiate and champion the green revolution in the country. The Green Revolution was mainly driven by MS Swaminathan's research into high yielding variety of crops, especially wheat and rice, which were the staple food grains 
in northern and southern India. These are the priority crops to ensure that at least basic food grains are available. So, the agricultural research of M.S. Swaminathan would introduce high yielding variety of crops into India and along with this scientific inputs were provided to agriculture such as fertilizers to improve soil fertility, to increase agricultural productivity and irrigation and water. So, this would substantially increase India's agricultural output and it would make India self-sufficient within a few years and this is what we refer to as the green revolution of India. Now, what exactly was M.S. Swaminathan's contribution here? See, M.S. Swaminathan, through his research, he focused on promoting high yield, high yielding varieties along with introducing scientific inputs. His research would contribute to government policy making and particularly in UP, then uh, Haryana and Punjab, right? The irrigation was being transformed through various large scale irrigation projects under the five year plans. So on one hand, the government was already taking up a big role in improving irrigation especially in these wheat cultivating regions. Similarly, in the rice cultivating areas as well, the government was trying to work with farmers to try and introduce scientific farming. So then agriculture minister C. Subramaniam would play a big role under the Indira Gandhi government. So as India initiated the Green Revolution, M.S. Swaminathan and his research would come in handy for the Indian government to introduce high yielding variety of crops along with scientific inputs into India's agriculture. M.S. Swaminathan not only worked on rice, but he also played a big role in increasing wheat productivity. He would bring high yielding variety of rice and wheat into India and this would became, become the mainstay of Indian agriculture. He would work with legendary agricultural scientist Norman Borlo, whom you can see here in this image, who was later even awarded the Nobel Prize for his contribution for food security in the world. So, M.S. Swaminathan would pursue the Norin dwarfing genes from Mexico where Norman Barlow was conducting his own agricultural research. M.S. Swaminathan after succeeding in introducing high yielding variety of rice in India, now he was focused on introducing high yielding variety of wheat as well. So, he would go to the United States to consult with a researcher and a fellow scientist but he would realize that the American variant, the dwarf wheat plant which had been developed in the US was not suited for Indian climate and Indian agricultural conditions. So he would suggest M.S. Swaminathan to go to Mexico where Norman Barlow was working on a dwarf wheat plant which would be more suited for Indian agroclimatic conditions. So following his interaction with Norman Barlow and the collaboration between them, the dwarf wheat variety would be introduced in India that would lead to a massive bumper crop in Punjab, Haryana because by then irrigation had been supplied through the large irrigation projects that had been created. The dams, the kennels uh, that had come up in northwestern India would provide the required water and the scientific inputs were brought in with these high yielding variety of crops that is what led to the green revolution in the country. The particular problem that researchers were facing in India was that the traditional variety of crops in India, they were very slender and tall. If you look at the native variants of wheat and rice that was cultivated until then by Indian farmers, they were very slender, they would go, grow to a considerable height and this was a problem when you provide scientific inputs because the moment you add fertilizers, increase the nutrition levels and provide good irrigation, obviously productivity increases, more grains are produced. But the problem was the ear bed, essentially the, the top grain holding structure of the plant, right, that would become very heavy at the top because of wheat grains and rice grains that accumulated at the top and as a result, the slender tall crops, they would fall onto the ground, right, they wouldn't balance themselves, they would fall onto the ground and this would lead to the problem of lodging. They would lodge with the soil and water on the ground, thereby leading to the destruction of the crop. So just adding fertilizer, providing water was not enough. It was important to provide that balance to the crop, to the plant. And it was needed, it was necessity rather, 
to dwarf the plant, to bring down the height. So, M. S. Swaminathan was pursuing the dwarfing genes that Norman Barlow had developed and was experimenting with in Mexico. In fact, when he went to the US to consult with his fellow scientist, he was pursuing the nor Norin dwarfing genes that would reduce the height of the wheat plant. But the American researcher would tell M. S. Swaminathan that, see, this variant is not suited for India. This is more suited for the American uh, agroclimatic conditions. Why don't you go, go and meet Norman Barlow, who's doing a similar research in Mexico? So that is where M. S. Swaminathan would bring in the Norin dwarfing genes and introduce them into the wheat and rice crops in India, which would reduce the height. The plant height would reduce, giving it more structural stability to withstand the weight at the top when the grains pop up. So this is what led to the tremendous success of the green revolution in the country. But of course, you might ask me, sir, how can one individual contribute to this whole effort? I'm not saying that. Of course, it was a collective national effort, right? But M. S. Swaminathan's strategic vision was crucial in the success of the Green Revolution. It was M. S. Swaminathan who would realize this problem, the lodging problem, and he would come up with a solution for that. Of course, it was a national effort. There was a great political vision behind it, which I'm going to discuss, right? There was a tremendous government effort as well. But, and of course, the farmers, right, at the grassroots. They were the ones who eventually championed the Green Revolution. But what we should really appreciate is the strategic vision of M.S. Swaminathan. He identified the core problem, brought a solution for that, which would transform India's agriculture forever. Now, coming to the political angle, what the government did, the then agriculture minister, food and agriculture minister, C. Subramaniam, is also equally credited with championing the Green Revolution. He would win the confidence of the Prime Minister, Indira Gandhi, and as well as Lal Bahadur Shastri, right, before uh, Indira Gandhi came to power. And with the full backing of the Prime Ministers, he would champion the introduction of scientific inputs into Indian agriculture. Introducing fertilizers was a critical step. But back then, India did not produce fertilizers on its own. We had to largely rely on imports. So when the agriculture minister suggested this idea, there was a lot of criticism and opposition against it. Because we were still under socialist era policies, there was a lot of uh, hesitancy against imports, uh, against relying on foreign countries. So there was a lot of opposition to this government policy. But it was C. Subramaniam who managed to overcome the political hurdle with the support of Prime Minister Lal Bahadur Shastri and then later Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. He would come out with an incentive policy for farmers. For the first time, the government was experimenting with incentives for farmers. Those farmers who use scientific inputs, who will use fertilizers, modern ir irrigation, and high yielding variety of plants, they would be incentivized by the government. Many experts criticize this, saying that this will increase the subsidy burden, it will increase government expenditure, plus we will pay for fertilizer imports. But C. Subramaniam had conviction in this plan, he went ahead and provided for incentives for farmers for adopting scientific inputs. Then, under the fourth five-year plan, the Indira Gandhi government would substantially increase the budgetary allocation for agriculture. This was a critical step. So by then, scientific inputs were being provided. The new variety of crop was introduced, thanks to the efforts of M. S. Swaminathan and C. Subramanian. So now was the time to add that extra financial support. And through the fourth five-year plan, the financial allocation was provided under the Indira Gandhi government. The Indian Agriculture Research Institute was established. So to provide the scientific support, a whole ecosystem was created to provide the scientific backup for Indian agriculture. So it was this collective effort, the political vision of the government, the then leaders, the strategic vision of M.S. Swaminathan and the collective effort of Indian farmers that would lead India towards a green revolution. Right? And within a couple of years, India's food production hit record levels. We became self-sufficient by 1970s and rest of it is history. Right. Today, India generates food surplus. We are not only meeting the requirements of our people, we have a surplus, we export as well, and we are one of the largest producers of most of the food crops in the country, uh, in the world. 
So this is where we take a moment to pay tribute to MS Swaminathan who passed away recently, just last year. Next, the other Bharat Ratna awardee, former Prime Minister P.V. Narasimha Rao. P.V. Narasimha Rao made an equally enormous contribution to India, in India's nation building. The two under very, very difficult and challenging circumstances. He would guide India during one of its gravest economic crises in early 90s. He would champion the LPG reforms along with his finance minister, Manmohan Singh. And he would diversify and transform Indian foreign policy by launching the Look East policy and many other doctrines and initiatives. So let's take a look at the role of P.V. Narsimha Rao. Again, this is not a discussion about the individual, their political ideology, the party they belong to. It's about their contribution towards nation building, which is a, a key part of our UPSC syllabus as well. And the topics we are going to cover right now is again very relevant for economy, for international relations, etc. Now, if you look at the early 90s, it was a very, very challenging period for India. The early 90s, 1991, 1992, was one of the most challenging phases in post-independence history. On one hand, India was dealing with a grave economic crisis, popularly referred to as the BOP crisis, the balance of payments crisis. Externally, there was a major foreign policy challenge. The Cold War had just ended. India had lost a reliable partner because of the disintegration of the Soviet Union. Plus, internally, there were a lot of divisions. Communal polarization had gone up. Multiple security threats were persisting. Right? So it was a very difficult, challenging period for the Prime Minister and the way he navigated India and came up with solutions for these challenges is what makes P.V. Narasimha Rao an eligible candidate for the Bharat Ratna. Talking about the economic crisis, decades of socialist policies had weakened the Indian economy and constrained the Indian economy. There was the Inspector Raj, License Raj era, where private enterprise was curbed and to do anything you had to get licenses from various government departments ministries you had to go through multiple rounds of inspections right and this had only bred red tapeism and corruption in the system because these so called government inspectors right and the authorities would be res responsible for issuing licenses to conduct inspections right they would always expect bribes and this had slowed down decision making. It had curtailed private enterprise and entrepreneurship. And more importantly, the market spirit had been completely curbed. So, the Indian economy was facing multiple challenges by 1990-1991. Fiscal deficit had shot up. Inflation was at high level. And public debt also had increased. And we reached a stage where our forex reserves depleted to alarming levels, very similar to what happened with Sri Lanka recently. So uh, with depleted forex reserves, we could have hardly sustained imports for another two to three weeks. After that, we wouldn't have any foreign exchange reserves left to pay for imports. So essentially, this was a situation where the Indian economy was on the brink of collapse. We couldn't have serviced the debt. Right? And with no forex reserves left, we couldn't have traded with the rest of the world. So, under this critical situation, India did rely on the IMF for support. We did request liquidity support from the IMF, which is responsible for bailing out countries facing such a liquidity crisis. The International Monetary Fund, which is dominated by Western countries, has always been criticized by developing nations of exploiting these situations. Because whenever it provides a bailout package or a, or a relief package, it always comes with conditions. The IMF placed a lot of conditions on India. It would pressurize India to devalue its currency, right? It would pressurize India to open up its markets and economy to allow for foreign competition, foreign investments. This was essentially an interference in our economic sovereignty. So, after taking some support from the IMF, India would chart its own course to open up the economy and to reform, completely reform the Indian economy. We popularly refer to this phase as LPG reforms. Liberalization, privatization, globalization. Under Prime Minister Narsimha Rao, Finance Minister Manmohan Singh, the then Finance Minister Manmohan Singh, 
would champion a series of economic reforms popularly labeled as the LPG reforms. India would end the license Raj, inspector Raj era. The restrictions involved in setting up enterprises, in running factories, in setting up companies, they were all relaxed. The, raw, the rules, the regulations, were they were all liberalized. Several measures were taken to ensure that industrial policy, trade policy, public sector organizations, they were all reformed and the fiscal corrections were also introduced. The government expenditure was brought back to normal levels. A fiscal correction was carried out. The Indian currency was devalued in order to make our exports more competitive. The currency devaluation was done because this would make our exports more competitive in the global market. It would make it cheaper in the global market. Now, India would open up its economy as well. We relaxed all the import controls and restrictions. We revised our FDI policy and selectively we opened up for foreign direct investment. We opened up our capital markets for foreign institutional investment, FII investments. So India opened up its economy, privatized a number of public institutions and public sector organizations, and we globalized with the rest of the world. We integrated our economy with the global economy. So these massive reforms are credited to the leadership of Prime Minister, then Prime Minister Narasimha Rao and Finance Minister Manmohan Singh. Apart from these economic reforms, the foreign policy changes were also equally significant. Because by 1991, the Cold War had come to an end. Cold War was a period of geopolitical rivalry between the Western countries and the Eastern Bloc. The two superpowers led by US and Soviet Union had divided the geopolitical world on ideological lines. US with Western countries was championing the cause of democracy and capitalism. The Soviet Union with the communist states, which led the Eastern power bloc, was championing the cause of communism and socialism. So from 1940s, late 1940s, after the Second World War, till 1991, the world was divided during the Cold War period. These powers would engage in covert wars against each other, target each other, undermine each other's influence in almost every country in the world. So during this phase of the Cold War, one reliable partner for India was the Soviet Union. Because the U United States, after 1971, had clearly become hostile towards India. Especially during the liberation of Bangladesh war, the US firmly sided with Pakistan and even threatened India with consequences during the conflict. The US would go on to undermine and even try to sabotage our nuclear and space program in the 70s and 80s. So India-US relations had taken a big hit and until then India which was championing the non-aligned movement till 1971 was forced to abandon non-alignment because of the American hostility. So it was during 1971 that then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi delivered a diplomatic masterstroke by signing the Treaty of Peace and Friendship with Soviet Union which transformed India-Soviet relations. India essentially abandoned the principle of non-alignment and clearly chose to align with Soviet Union given the American threat. Since then, the Soviet Union became a critical partner for India. From supplying weapons to modernize our armed forces, to giving unconditional diplomatic support at key global organizations like United Nations, the Soviet Union was always there for India. It would even aid and back our nuclear program and space program as well. So Soviet Union essentially became an all-weather friend for India. So in 1991, when Soviet Union collapsed and brought the Cold War to an end, India had lost a great friend. India lost a strategic partner. So this was a crucial juncture in global geopolitics where India suddenly felt lost. So India needed global support, global diplomatic support. We needed other countries to back India's position. We could no longer rely on the Soviet Union. Right? Of course, the successor state to Soviet Union, which is Russia, which would continue the same close relationship. But we could no longer rely on just one power to support India and back our interests. India needed to diversify its foreign relations. Until then, we had been largely preoccupied with our own neighbors and with superpowers like US and Soviet Union. We hadn't paid much attention to other Asian countries, especially in Southeast and East Asia. We hadn't paid much attention even to Africa and Latin America. 
our ties with West Asian countries also had been to an extent neglected. Right? So this was a time for India to diversify its foreign relations because there was an economic necessity as well, not just a geopolitical necessity. Since we had introduced LPG reforms, globalized our economy, we needed foreign investments to drive our economic growth. We had to attract foreign capital. We needed raw materials, resources to power the rise of the Indian economy. And more importantly, we needed new markets for our exports. We had to create new export markets for our farmers, for our MSME industry, for India's producers. So these were the necessities of that time. And it was under Narsimha Rao that India diversified its foreign policy. Until then, we were largely preoccupied with just the neighborhood and the large powers. But we hadn't paid attention to many other countries and many other potential markets. So now, India quickly opened up its foreign policy. We diversified our relations. And one of the most important doctrines that was launched was the Look East policy of India. In 1991-92, India launched the Look East policy under the leadership of Narsimha Rao to pay special attention to India's extended neighborhood in the Indo-Pacific. The focus of this policy was Southeast Asia and even East Asia to step up our ties with the ASEAN group, which is a regional grouping of 10 Southeast Asian countries to promote our economic relations, political, strategic and defense relations and even cultural relations with India's eastern neighborhood. The idea was to look east and start focusing eastwards to cultivate these relations with Southeast Asia and East Asia. Because historically, even if you look at ancient medieval times, India has close deep connections with Southeast Asia and even East Asia. The idea was to revive those historical cultural links dating back to the times of Buddhism, to the Cholan, uh, Cholas who had extensive influence across Southeast Asia. The idea was to revive and build upon those cultural ties and promote strong economic, political and defense relations. So from Myanmar to Japan, from Indonesia to Philippines, all these countries came under focus for India under the Look East policy. We have seen tremendous achievements under the Look East. We have a free trade agreement with ASEAN group, right? We got closer to Japan, closer to South Korea. We have another free trade agreement with Japan as well. We had taken up many important projects across Southeast Asia. The Kaladan project that we discussed yesterday was the outcome of Look East policy. The trilateral highway, the IMT trilateral highway connecting India, Myanmar, Thailand. Again, an initiative that was conceptualized under Look East policy. So many such big initiatives were taken up to bring India closer to Southeast and East Asia. Today, the Modi government has upgraded this policy into the Act East policy to act eastwards, to be more proactive in engaging with our Southeast Asian and East Asian partners to promote defense and strategic relations, economic ties and cultural ties. So this has been a remarkable success for India. Then P. V. Narasimha Rao even went ahead and brought out India's secret relations with Israel into the open, into the public and established formal diplomatic relations with Israel in 1992. Given the situation in West Asia over the Israel-Palestine question and the divide within West Asia, where all Arab countries had aligned against Israel, it had been difficult for India to set up ties with Israel until 1992. But however, we had a secret relationship, a covert relationship, which had started from 1968 under Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. Since both India and Israel had common security concerns, in the security domain, the Indira Gandhi government had started a covert relationship with Israel, which was not publicly acknowledged, which was not publicly known, through their respective intelligence agencies, that is India's RAW and Israel's Mossad. A covert intelligence-based relationship had been set up, but we had no official ties, no official diplomatic relations existed between India and Israel until 1992. So now that Global geopolitics was changing. Cold War had ended. The very dynamics in West Asia had changed. Some Arab countries had secretly aligned with Israel as well. So now it was the right situation for India to reach out to Israel. And it was P.V. Narsimha Rao who formally established ties with Israel. Apart from this, P.V. Narsimha Rao also dealt with many other foreign policy and security challenges. 
He's credited with accelerating India's nuclear weapons program, despite tremendous American pressure and even American efforts to sabotage our nuclear and space program. He dealt with many security challenges, including the Khalistan movement, the Kashmir militancy phase, which had begun from 1987. It reached its peak in 1990s. Kashmir insurgency and terrorism reached its peak with Pakistani support. This is when we witnessed the peak of Pakistan state-sponsored terrorism. This spread to our cities, our urban areas as well, with the 93 Bombay blasts. So Pakistan was stepping up its covert proxy war against India by backing these terrorist forces. It was backing the Khalistan terror outfits in Punjab and abroad. It was directly backing Kashmir insurgency and terrorism from across the border. And it would spread terrorism across Indian cities as well through the 93 Bombay blast, starting with the 93 Bombay blast. So these were very challenging circumstances. Parallelly, there was a crisis going on in Sri Lanka. The ethnic war was continuing. Former Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi had been assassinated by the LTTE. It was because of Rajiv Gandhi's assassination that Narsimha Rao could become the Prime Minister. Or else, Rajiv Gandhi was popularly expected, believed, to win the elections and to lead the country. Following his, ass his assassination by the LTTE, India had an enormous challenge in Sri Lanka to repair the relationship and also to contain the threat posed by LTTE. Plus, there was large-scale communal polarization by certain parties and religious organizations. The demolition of Babri Masjid, the communal riots that followed, happens to be one dark spot in the career of P.V. Narsimha Rao, and his critics have often pointed this out, that this was probably the only failure of P.V. Narsimha Rao. His failure to deal with the communal situation and failure to prevent the riots, the Hindu-Muslim riots that followed in 1992. In fact, B. Raman, a popular IPS officer, right, who retired as an additional secretary with RAW, he has written a very popular book called The Cowboys of RAW. It's a tribute to R.N. Cow, the founding director of RAW. In 1968, when India's foreign intelligence agency was set up by the Indira Gandhi government, it was R.N. Cow who became the first director of RAW. So as a tribute to him and his contribution to India's uh, foreign intelligence, B. Raman, right, he writes in his book, The Cowboys of Raw, and he details some of the contributions of various prime ministers, and he specifically talks about P. V. Narsimha Rao and how he contributed to India's national security and foreign policy. I have taken some of these excerpts, and I have shared this here and in the next slide. You can go through this later. This will just give you an idea regarding how Narsimha Rao dealt with challenging situations created in Kashmir, then in Punjab, and as well as the communal situation, right? And how India would step up its efforts against Pakistan, how India would deal with US. So all these challenges have been outlined by B. Raman in his popular book, right? And he talks about the role of Prime Minister Narsimha Rao in guiding India during these difficult circumstances. He would encourage both RAW and MEA to counter Pakistan both diplomatically and as well as through intelligence operations. He would give both RAW and MEA a free hand to step up India's pressure and to show how Pakistan was involved in state sponsorship of terrorism, especially after the Bombay blast. P.V. Narsimha Rao would direct RAW to use the evidence that we had gained to show the links with Pakistan and present this to the global audience, to the global community, to try and win international support in order to bring diplomatic pressure on Pakistan. He would still pursue good relations with Nawaz Sharif, Benzir Bhutto, the then leaders of Pakistan. He would stand up to American pressure and American tactics, right? So that is something B. Raman talks about, and you can just go through this just to get a better idea regarding the challenges that India faced and how, under Nasim Rao, India managed to overcome many of these challenges. So this completes my detailed discussion of the big articles today. Now let's look at the prelim section. We have an article on page number 10 that refers to the question whether the preamble can be amended and in what context was the preamble amended in 1976. See, right now the Supreme Court of India is dealing with a particular case, a petition 
filed by Dr. Subramaniam Swami. He has challenged the 42nd Amendment Act. The 42nd Amendment Act, which was introduced in 1976 under the Indira Gandhi government during the emergency period, it's one of the most controversial constitutional amendments. It's called a mini constitution in itself because it carried out many changes to the constitution and many of them have been criticized as they have promoted authoritarian tendencies, a strong center, right? And it was largely passed without debate, without uh, questions asked during the emergency period. One big change carried out by the 42nd Amendment Act was the introduction of three specific words to the preamble. You can see the original preamble over here that was adopted by the Constituent Assembly on 26th November 1949. That was the date on which Indian Constitution was adopted by the Constituent Assembly. Now here you can see the modified version, the amended version. The 42nd Amendment Act introduced the term socialist and secular over here. Until then, the preamble said that we the people of India have solemnly resolved to constitute India into a sovereign democratic republic. So with the addition of socialist and secular, right, India's socialist and secular credentials were firmly established. It's not that India's constitution or Indian polity was not secular before. It was inherently the Indian constitution had secular features, right? India indeed had adopted a mixed model economy with socialist principles along with few free market principles. From the beginning, India was inherently a, a mixed economy model and inherently a secular nation, a secular society. But the addition of these terms served a purpose to highlight that India was a socialist secular nation. Then the other word added was integrity. Under fraternity, which talks about unity of India, unity of the nation, the word integrity was also added. Fraternity assuring the dignity of the individual and unity and integrity of the nation. Because then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi believed that India faced many challenges externally and internally. There was a threat to the integrity of the nation, right? Many argue it was all based on fear and false assumptions as well, but let's not get into the politics of it. The word integrity of the nation was also added over here. So these are the three changes carried out. So now Subramaniam Swami is questioning, was it right to amend the preamble and should this be struck down? The Supreme Court, which is looking into this, has made a very important academic observation, a legal observation. The Supreme Court has asked a question. See, the preamble was amended, but was it correct to keep the same date as the date of adoption? The first preamble which was adopted was in 26th, was on 26th November 1949. So accordingly, that was the date added here, the day on which the constitution was adopted with the adoption of the preamble. So now in 1976, if the preamble was amended by adding these three words, then shouldn't the date be changed as well? The Supreme Court is asking this academic legal question, right? The Supreme Court will answer this in the coming days. There is no final judgment yet. The question is, the date retained, the date was retained even after the amendment. Even after the amendment was carried out, you can see in the amended preamble that the preamble says that the constitution is being adopted on 26th November 1949. So the date has not changed. Is this correct? Is this constitutionally legally valid? Is this academically and from a legal point of view, is this the right thing to do? That is what the Supreme Court has asked. Now coming to the question whether the preamble can be amended or not, this has already been clarified by the Supreme Court in the landmark Keshwanand Bharti case, the 13 judges case. In the Keshwanand Bharti judgment, the Supreme Court had already held that preamble is integral to the constitution of India. It's an integral part. In fact, UPSC also has asked questions on, on, on this particular topic. The preamble is indeed a part of the constitution. The Supreme Court clarified this in Keshwar and the Bharti case, which means preamble can also be amended under the amending powers of the parliament. If parliament has the power to amend the constitution under article 368, then this will extend to preamble as well because preamble is an integral part of the constitution. But as long as basic structure is not touched, the basic structure, if that is not tinkered with, then parliament has the power to amend the preamble as well as it is an integral part of the constitution. 
So this was already clarified with the Supreme Court in the Keshwar and the Bharti judgment. But now the Supreme Court is yet to pass a final verdict on the 42nd Amendment Act. Because many of the controversial amendments introduced through 42nd Amendment Act, they have already been reversed. For example, provisions related to President's rule, right? That was very controversial where center had gained more powers. Some of it was neutralized through the 44th Amendment Act. And over a period of time, many other amendments have rectified the errors that were brought in by the 42nd Amendment Act. So now Subramaniam Swami is questioning the inclusion of these three terms, socialist, secular and integrity in the preamble. And the Supreme Court is yet to pass a final judgment. But right now it's raised a academic question that shouldn't the date be changed as well? The date on which preamble was adopted. Now that it was amended with the addition of new words, shouldn't the date reflect a change as well? That is the question the Supreme Court has asked. Next, we have another article related to the Supreme Court itself on page number 11. The government of India has recently said that it has accepted the recommendations of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Law and Justice and even the Law Commission's recommendation to provide for the establishment of regional benches to the Supreme Court. As you know, right now the Supreme Court is seated only in Delhi, in the national capital. Correct? But this creates a problem of access not everyone can approach the Supreme Court for, for ensuring our fundamental rights. Not everyone from every nook and corner of India can go to Delhi, file a case and fight a case at the Supreme Court. Right? This creates a logistical challenge, a geographical uh, constraint. So there has been a long-standing recommendation that regional benches have to be set up across the country. Right? In fact, the constitution provides for this, which is this article. It is Article 130. Article 130 of the Constitution states that the Supreme Court shall sit in Delhi, which is the national capital, and at also other such places, meaning regional benches can be set up by the Chief Justice of India with the approval of the President. With the approval of the President, that is essentially the Council of Ministers, Right? Because president is bound by the aid and advice of the Council of Ministers. The Chief Justice of India can provide for the establishment of regional benches. So that people from different parts of the country, they need not come to Delhi to file a case and fight a case in the Supreme Court. Someone from Northeast India, someone, someone from Tamil Nadu or Gujarat, they need not waste their time, their money and the effort to, to go to Delhi to ensure that their basic rights are guaranteed and protected. So this issue was examined by the Law Commission as well, the 18th Law Commission, it had recommended the establishment of regional benches because right now Supreme Court of India is overburdened. There's a huge backlog of cases as well. And the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Law and Justice also had recommended the establishment of regional benches recently. And the government recently informed the parliament that it has accepted the recommendation. The government has accepted, the Ministry of Law and Justice has accepted the recommendation of the Parliamentary Standing Committee that Supreme Court should have regional benches. But now it is left to the Supreme Court, the Chief Justice. Because Article 130 says that Chief Justice will provide for the establishment of regional benches with approval from the President. So with regard to this question, the government has informed the Parliament that Supreme Court has said that regional benches are not needed. A question was raised during question hour by your opposition MP. That what is the government doing on the recommendation of the Standing Committee and the Law Commission which recommended the establishment of regional benches? To this the government replied, see we have accepted the recommendation, we are ready to set up regional benches but it's left to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court has informed the government that regional benches are not needed as of now. Understood? Next, on page number 5, we have a, oh, sorry, page number 14. We have an article referring to the refugee crisis in the Mediterranean. This small article, it refers to a tragic incident in the Mediterranean, which has become a recurring feature, a recurring problem. A migrant boat carrying a boat full of refugees has capsized and in a tragic incident, 13 Sudanese refugees who were looking to sneak into Europe have lost their lives. 
this boat had set off from Tunisia, which is a small North African country. And this is not a new problem. This is persisting from the last many years. From across Africa and West Asia, people are fleeing economic backwardness, civil wars, conflicts, etc. And they are desperately trying to make it to Europe to seek refuge in order to, <coughs> in order to protect their life and also to lead a better standard of life. So this has created a massive refugee problem across the Mediterranean. And many of these refugees, they lose their lives, unfortunately, in the, such tragic incidents. They often take the help of these human traffickers who enable them to cross over into Europe from Tunisia and Libya. Please look at the map. You're looking at the map of Africa and West Asia here. Across this region, which is called the MENA region, Middle East, North Africa region, there are wars, civil wars, terrorism and economic backwardness and political crisis going on. In West Africa, for example, you have countries like Sierra Leone, Guinea, Burkina Faso, even Nigeria, Niger and many others which are very backward dealing with political instability and terrorism and even civil wars. Sudan, which is in news, right? It is Sudanese refugees who have lost their lives in this incident. Sudan is currently going through a civil war that started last year, right? Libya is going through a civil war. Tunisia went through a major rebellion and still it has political instability. Algeria, even Morocco to an extent, even though Morocco is a little stable, there is a lot of economic backwardness. So across North Africa, West Africa and West Asia, there are multiple challenges. There is a threat to the lives of people, right? Their quality of life, standard of life has been affected. So those who are suffering from wars, civil wars, conflicts, terrorism, economic backwardness, they're all trying to flee the region and quite often they try to make this risky sea route from North Africa or West Asia to enter the European region. Once they land on the other side, they try to seek refuge. So this is a problem facing all the Mediterranean countries and even the European, all the European nations. Portugal and Spain, Italy and Greece, even Turkey, Croatia and others which lie on the Mediterranean coast, they're all facing this problem. These refugees not only try to settle here, they might even move towards Germany, Netherlands, Belgium, France to seek refuge. Is that clear? But this crisis has reached enormous proportions. It has affected the society in Europe as well, leading to social problems, demographic changes. It has created security issues in Europe. And it has become a political uh, topic, a politically divisive topic, where the European politics has, has been divided on the topic of refugees and illegal migration from Africa and West Asia. So these tragic incidents keep happening in the Mediterranean Sea, where hundreds of people, hundreds of refugees coming from war-torn regions, from extreme poverty, right? Their boats have capsized. Many of them lose their lives in the process. So this is a challenge that European countries are dealing with, the European Union is dealing with. So this is something you should be aware of. Now coming to the last article on page 14, on the same page, we have an update with regard to the Indian Ocean Conference. The Indian Ocean Conference has started at Perth in Australia and India's foreign minister is attending it along with Sri Lanka's leader, Ranil Vikramasinghe. So this is a major diplomatic event which is organized by a few think tanks with the backing of Indian government. This is the seventh edition of the Indian Ocean Conference, which is taking place. It's a track 1.5 dialogue, meaning it involves a mix of diplomats and government officials and leaders and strategic experts, academicians, think tanks, and other non-state entities. So when such a diplomatic event is held, where there is a mix of government representatives, official government diplomats and delegates, along with non-official delegates, non-state delegates. Such events are called Track 1.5 Diplomatic Events. All right. In Track 1 events, it's only the governments which are involved, only the state actors. So if two governments are meeting and discussing and negotiating, that's a Track 1 Diplomatic Event. A Track 2 Diplomatic Event is completely non-state. There might be some state support indirectly, but only if the media, think tanks and experts are meeting and former retired officials are involved, 
that would be a track two dialogue, a track two diplomatic event. Track 1.5 event is a mix of both. So there would be official state representation as well and non-state representation as well. So Indian Ocean Conference is one such track 1.5 event organized by an Indian think tank called India Foundation. It is headed by the son of Ajit Doval, who is the National Security Advisor of India. And India Foundation, with the backing of Ministry of External Affairs, has been organizing the Indian Ocean Conference over the last few years. So this time it's being held in Perth in Australia with the support of the Australian government. The Australian Department of Foreign Affairs is supporting it with few other think tanks and academic institutions, including the Rajaratnam School of International Studies from Singapore. So this conference provides India and other countries in the region an opportunity to talk about the challenges in the Indian Ocean, the security challenges, foreign policy challenges. So India's Foreign Minister, Dr. Jai Shankar, has pointed out all the major challenges affecting the Indian Ocean. He has spoken about Chinese aggression in the South China Sea and in the Indian Ocean. He has highlighted the crisis in the Red Sea and Arabian Sea created by the Houthis of Yemen, how they are targeting commercial ships and destabilizing shipping in the Indian Ocean. He has also pointed out the dual use of ports by Chinese Navy. The Chinese Navy has invested in strategic ports across the Indian Ocean, in Sri Lanka, Maldives, etc. And every now and then, China brings these so-called research vessels, which are actually spy vessels, which can spy on other countries. So recently, Sri Lanka has put a moratorium on allowing these Chinese dual ships. Right? Previously, China had allowed some of them, triggering a controversy with India. It had allowed few Chinese spy vessels to dock at Hambantota and Colombo, which was seen as a threat by India. But now that Sri Lanka is a good friend of India, now that it has stopped favoring China, Sri Lanka has stopped accepting these Chinese vessels from docking at Sri Lankan ports. But however, Maldives, which has clearly shown a pro-China tilt under the new president, has recently allowed a Chinese research vessel, which is essentially a spy vessel, to dock at a strategic port in Maldives. So all these events, which destabilize Indian Ocean, has been brought up by India's foreign minister at the Indian Ocean Conference. So please make a note of this. There could be a possible question on Indian Ocean Conference. What is it? Uh, who organizes it? What is its purpose? On these lines, there could be a question. And this is fully in line with our Sagar doctrine. This is the foreign policy doctrine of the Modi government towards the Indian Ocean and the Pacific region. Security and growth for all in the region. So on this note, I conclude the discussion of the Hindu newspaper today. Please take up these two practice questions. You can make a note and try to write answers for these questions. It's all based on what we have discussed. So this will help you in your answer writing practice. So with this, I bring my discussion to an end. I hope you guys have liked the session. If you did, please comment below, press the like button, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel.